Okay, well, here in chapter 44 of the book of Jeremiah, this chapter is, is kind of a continuation of the last chapter. This is more of, uh, you remember the last chapter he prophesied of these, the, the Jews, the Judahites that were heading to Egypt after the destruction of Babylon and the whole thing with Ishmael and Gedaliah and stuff, that they're going to be destroyed by sword and famine and pestilence and things anyways. Now he's, Jeremiah is going to give an expanded prophecy to all of the Israelites that are in Egypt. So there's several other groups that settled out this way before the Babylonian destruction. And so they're going to be now the prophecy for them all that are in the land of Egypt. So verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt. So this is which dwell at Migdol, at Taphanes, that's the one that we were talking about last chapter, and at Noth, and in the country of Pathros, saying, okay, so again, these are the ones that fled uh, earlier as well as at this current present time. Verse 2, uh, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, ye have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah, and behold, this day they are a desolation, and no man dwelleth therein. So he's, he's setting it up, setting up the prophecy for them. Now, when we look at these areas where these people are going to be, okay, Migdol actually means tower. Uh, so from verse 1, Migdol is one of those towns, so that means tower. Uh, it's known in the Tel El Amarna tablets from the 14th century BC as Ma Agadalai. It is mentioned again in the days of Exodus and also in Ezekiel's time. The name is Semitic, probably borrowed by the Egyptians from the Canaanites. We do not know whether all these texts refer to the same place, but they probably do. The place was located in the east of the Delta region, probably in the same general area as Taphanes. The exact site is unknown. Tel El Hur, midway between Pelusium and Sele, has been suggested. Now, Noth, a variant form of Moth, is a Hebrew name for Memphis, the chief city of Lower Egypt, or Northern Egypt. It was situated some 13 miles south of modern Cairo. Pathros was a name of Upper Egypt, literally the land of the south. So you got to think kind of reverse when you think of geography in Egypt. So Lower Egypt is Northern Egypt. Southern Egypt is Upper Egypt. Egypt, okay? The mountain range where the Nile starts is in Central Africa. From there, when the rains come, all the water flows north through the Nile into the Mediterranean and out to the ocean. So it goes north. We think of it as rivers flowing south, but in Egypt it goes north. So Upper Egypt is Southern Egypt. Northern Egypt is Lower Egypt, basically. So you just remember that. It feels opposite what it should, but that's how you Got to think about it. Now, the expression, the land of Pathros, suggests a region which is known that a, it is now known that a sizable Jewish community was established at Elephantine, Elephantine, an island on the Nile in southern Egypt. During the 5th century BC, important Aramaic documents left by them have provided valuable information about their society. How early this colony was founded is not known, but to judge from Jeremiah 44, it was there already just after the fall of Jerusalem in 587 BC. And this is where the Nag Hammadi library comes from in the ancient writings is the people of Elephantine. So we're getting this prophecy set up, reminding the people, you've just watched, witness God destroying, letting Babylon destroy Jerusalem. So verse 3, because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they know not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. So this is, again, there's idolatry happening here. Following other gods is what caused the destruction. Disobedience, spiritual adultery is what caused the destruction. The people wouldn't repent of this. Uh, now, three groups of people are mentioned in here. There's the people who used to be at Jerusalem, the people who are now in Egypt, and their ancestors. So again, they whom do not, neither they, the people who have been to Egypt, and not ye, people who were in Egypt during destruction, and not your fathers, the people who came before you. Basically, they all served false gods. 
Verse 4, Howbeit I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. So God sending, has sent his prophets for hundreds of years to warn the people, and they wouldn't listen. That's why they got destroyed. So verse 6, Wherefore my fury and mine anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. Therefore now thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling, out of Judah to leave you none to remain. In that ye provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands. That's idol worship. You're, you're building your own gods to worship. Burning incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt, whither ye be gone to dwell, that ye might cut yourselves off, that ye might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Now this is, this is important to look at because, again, the culture of the time was when you move to a different land, you worship the God of that land. And what God is saying is, no, 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 no. Just because you're not in Jerusalem doesn't mean you should not worship me. I am your God. I am not just the God of a land. I am the God of the universe. I created all of this. Worship me everywhere you go, basically. So verse 9, Have ye forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives in your own wickedness? And the wickedness of your wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. So he's like, are, are you not paying attention to history here? Now, the wickedness of their wives. We could look at this, and I think most people would interpret this as uh, adultery, sexual immorality. That is possible. But we have to realize if we go back in Jeremiah we'll see that there was a time where there was a, when Josiah was doing his reforms, that it talked about in the early parts of Jeremiah that the women, the mothers, had a female goddess worship. The whole family was involved, but it was primarily women worshiping a goddess. That's more likely what this is talking about, is these women were worshiping a false goddess not the true God. And that's their wickedness, what they got in trouble for, basically. So verse 10, They are not humbled even unto this day, neither have they feared, nor walked in my law, nor in my statutes, that I set before you and before your fathers. So even with everything they have suffered, they've watched the destruction of Jerusalem, they watched Babylon march through more than once and annihilate the place. They're terrified of Babylon they still won't repent and follow the true God. Even in a different land, they're still not following the true God. Verse 11, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. So these people haven't learned their lessons yet. Uh, 12, And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there. And they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. And they shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. Now, this is not just the people who have gone to Egypt since the destruction of Jerusalem, like with, with the, that ban that had Jeremiah in it. Uh, this is probably talking about the people who even fled before, e before Babylon marched in and decided to stay instead of go back to Jerusalem, uh, basically. So we can see in this that the hope of a continuation of Judah is not coming from those who fled to Egypt. The hope of a remnant of Israel being preserved and coming back is from those who are in captivity in Babylon. They're the ones that the promises will come through they will return and deal with the situation. Everybody else is going to be killed in Egypt, basically. Verse 13, For I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. 
so that none of the remnant of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, shall escape or remain, that they should return into the land of Judah, to the which they have a desire to return to dwell there. For none shall return, but such as shall escape. So they're not going to make it, basically. Uh, verse 15, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, as we mentioned just a minute ago, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah. So this is them replying back to Jeremiah. Okay, so they're saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. That's pretty straightforward. We're not believing you, Jeremiah. But, verse 17, we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven. Remember, we mentioned that just a minute ago. And to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Wow, these people are hard. Holy cow. Now, this is, let's, I want to read something about this. Thompson talks about this, so this will add, remind us of that context from before. So the women in this time were often seen as property of their husbands and fathers, and they're commonly treated this way. That's, that's just what it was. When you, if you were a daughter of, of a, you know, you had a, had a dad, you were his property. If someone raped you, they owed the dad money for damaging his property. That's, that's the way they thought about women back then. You were not, you didn't have voting rights. You couldn't own stuff yourself. You were property. You were an extension of a man. You had to be married or a have a dad to have status and opportunity. Uh, so what was interesting is because of this, the women got together and did their own priestly duties and worships, basically. So they're not allowed to perform a lot of the priestly activities either. So they treat it, they tended to create their own groups and opportunities for worship. One of these is this worship is the queen of heaven. This is a rare glimpse into this practice, which is still being researched today. This was most likely seen as an idol worship since it was replacing Yahweh as God. So the women wanted to have their autonomy. They wanted to worship, but they couldn't. And so they went out and did it on their own. The queen of heaven at this period was probably the Assyrian Babylonian goddess Ishtar, who was known by this title. This goddess is probably to be identified with Astarte, or Ashtoreth, the Canaanite goddess of fertility. An Egyptian text refers to the worship of Anat, a Canaanite fertility goddess in Egypt. Whatever the exact identity, the queen of heaven seems to have been a fertility goddess. We have referred to the determined policy of these Jews in Egypt to adhere to their allegiance to the Queen of Heaven. Certainly, the latter Elephantine documents, very late 5th century, give a clear indication of syncretism. There was even a goddess Anat Yahu worshipped there, which means Anat of Yahweh. So there's clear in the Nag Hammadi Library at Elephantine, they found worship of the Queen of Heaven, basically. So before we get into this and think, oh, look, that means there's a mother in heaven and we're worshiping the mother of heaven. Why can't we do that today? No, 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 no. This is worshiping false goddesses. This is, this is basically trying to take uh, pagan worship and make it seem right. So do not confuse that. This isn't like they were suddenly worshiping something that we don't do today. And so we should restore that worship. They were worshiping falsehood back then, that they'd made it try to sound like it was true. There's a big distinction on that. So be careful thinking, taking this at face value and thinking, oh, they, they worship the mother in heaven, so why can't we? This is not a good justification for that. Do not use these chapters in the Old Testament to justify mother in heaven worship because it's not there. That's not what these mean, basically. So be careful with that, okay? But they're telling, basically, what they're saying here to, Drew, to Jeremiah is, look, 
When we worshiped the queen of heaven, we were in prosperous times. We didn't see evil times. It wasn't until Babylon just suddenly happened to show up and win that we saw bad times. So in their mind, they're not connecting the dots that the Babylonian destruction is because of the idol worship. They don't see it that way. Again, perspective makes such a difference. Let's make sure we're focusing on having God's perspective, which comes through the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Have the Spirit with you to find and understand the true perspectives you need to have in life. They're not using the right perspective. They're looking at it going, when we worship this idol, things were good, and then suddenly Babylon came down in an unknown reason and destroyed us. And that's where they're coming from. Because that's what they said here. And even in fact, verse 18 But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. So they're saying, basically, we stopped worshiping her because of the destruction and now we're poor and destitute. So in their mind, there's the causation. Not worshiping the goddess of heaven means life is getting worse. If we go back to worshiping the God of heaven, life is going to get better. That's their their causation or even correlation, really, in, in their thinking. And that's completely backwards from what God is telling Jeremiah. So be careful. Sometimes we can religiously justify what we think sounds logical, but it is a cop-out for us to do what we want to do and not truly be humble and have a contrite spirit and broken heart and do what God wants. So we have to be careful about that, even in our own life. This is the thing that we can catch us on. So these people saying, if worshiping Yahweh is the right way, why did Josiah's reforms not work? That's kind of the other part of this, basically. It's, well, we, we worship Yahweh with Josiah, and it didn't work out for us, so we went back to the Queen of Heaven, and it's worked better. Um, that's the problem, basically. So verse 19, And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her? And pour out drink offerings unto her without our men. So the priestesses were doing everything in this worship. Men weren't, they didn't have priests. They had priestesses. They didn't need the patriarchy to help them with their worship. Uh, so this, there's some feminist logic in here. Uh, so just again, be careful. Not saying feminist logic is bad. But you have to understand if your logic, no matter how well intentioned it sounds on the surface, if your logic defies what God is telling us to do, it's still wrong. It's still bad. You can't get around that. God's perspective is the one we need to look at. And most people are not following God's perspective. Even those who claim to be religious, most people are not following God's real perspective. So you've got to pay attention to the Holy Spirit to guide you in finding that proper perspective. Uh, verse 20, then Jeremiah said, so he's now responding back to them, unto all the people, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, your princesses, princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them, and it came not into his mind? so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. So there, God, Jeremiah's trying to say, you've got it all wrong, folks. It's because of you doing the idol worship, burning the incense and all that stuff to the false gods, which is why the whole city was destroyed. And if you do the same worship now in Egypt, you're going to be destroyed again. It's going to happen again. You're going to be destroyed. So do not follow that. Okay, so verse 23. Uh, no, let's see. Where did I leave off? So let's see. Yeah, verse 23. Because ye have sinned, because you have burned incense, and because ye have sinned against the Lord, ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies. Therefore, this evil is happened unto you at this day. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, 
Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah that are in the land of Egypt. Now, I'm going to pause for just a second here because in the Septuagint, these last few verses are mainly addressed to the women. So here in the King James Version, it's to all the people and to the women. In the Septuagint, it's only to the women that Jeremiah is talking, basically. So most likely the priestesses of the Queen of Heaven. Verse 25, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths, and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed, to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows, and surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn in my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. So he's, he's saying, fine, if you guys want to worship the Queen of Heaven, you cannot utter my name anymore. You can't come to me. Verse 27, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. They, see, and all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. So if they won't repent, God's not going to help them and he's going to allow the judgments because they're not repenting. They're still sinning, so there's a just judgment that has to be paid. He's not stopping that from happening to him, basically. That's their disobedience. Verse 28, Yet a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah, and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand, mine or theirs. So this is again Jeremiah. You remember when he was, he was um, Jeremiah was, challenged by the priests in Jerusalem, and he said, fine, let's wait and see whose words come out. And Jeremiah was proven right. Now he's saying it again. Fine, you're not going to listen to me. Let's just wait and see what happens and who will be vindicated. Basically is what it is. So verse 29, and this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that's in Egypt, that ye may know that my word shall surely stand against you for evil. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, and into the hand of them that seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah the king of Judah into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, that sought his life. Now this, is, he mentions Pharaoh Hophra. This is actually Pharaoh Apres. He is the Pharaoh that pledged support to Zedekiah and Judah and sent troops in 588 BC to help them. Now in 570 BC, there seems to have been a revolt against Apres during his war against Libya. His general Amasis was sent to stop the revolt, but ended up being pronounced king. And so there was a dual reign for a while until Apres was executed uh, a couple of years later. Now, that's all according to Herodotus, a Greek historian. So, Pharaoh Hophra could be uh, not Apres, but possibly um, Amasis, or right after that. Apres dies, Amasis takes over, Babylon comes in, wipes them all out, basically, for the, for the Jews. So, it's not going to end well. These people are, are challenging God's word, basically, and so they're going to feel the justice of God, feel those ramifications of their choices is what they're going to face. Now let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue the story forward.